При въезде в эти самые жуткие города. Here are the instructions that everyone needs to follow when entering the city. Firstly, you must lower your car's windows to let the cartel see you and let them know that you have good intentions. Stranger or not, you still have to do it. Otherwise, if your windows are up, God forbid tinted, the aggression towards you is guaranteed. Therefore, we will now go to a nearby city, wait for them to see us, and they might even stop and question us. People, today I will show you a country where even the police drive around with gunmen for security. Police has no control in the city, and they don't even come here. If they do though, expect a massive conflict. We'll visit the Guerrero State Mountains, home of the largest heroin plantations in the country. This is where Mexicans grow their stuff. We'll talk to local gang members who weigh their cash because it's quicker to count it that way. These people don't just control a shop or a street, nope, not even districts. Instead, they control entire villages and towns. Each of these guys has a gun. Some look like Mosin rifles, some look like hunting guns and even shotguns. I'll try and meet up with one of the largest narco cartels in Mexico to figure out just how much of the illegal stuff do they actually sell. <laughs> Okay, uh, they've taken me to some dodgy courtyard. Kind of get in here through this uh, secret door, believe it or not. And I hope we come out of here afterwards. This beautiful bridge is basically the entrance to Mexico's most dangerous region. It's the Guerrero State, where half of Mexico's heroin production takes place. Honestly, when I was on my way to Mexico, I had no idea that this trip would turn out to be one of the most insane trips of my life. All due to the fact that Mexico is now experiencing a new evolution of drug wars. And today I'll visit cities with no army, no police, since it's narcos who control them. Welcome to How Do People Live by Leodov from Mexico. The real map of Mexico has nothing to do with what you see on Google Maps. The whole country is split between gangs, locally called the cartels. And as for the rich and powerful ones, there are 10 of them. The 1,000 member strong Tijuana cartel is situated on the coast. Then comes the Juarez cartel, located at the border with the US. It is the most ruthless cartel in Mexico, known for burning people alive in their cars and hanging some people from lampposts just because they can. It's hard not to mention the Los Zetas cartel, renowned for their professionalism. This cartel comprises special forces, fugitives, and paratroopers from the local army. At first, these guys were like an army for rent, mercenaries, but then they became stronger and formed a fully-fledged cartel. Still, as for the two most historically powerful cartels in the country, it's of course the Sinaloa cartel, responsible for 60% of drug trafficking into the US. Actually, these guys are more of a government. They have their own fleet of 600 planes, which is five times more than Mexico's largest airline, Aeromexico. And an army equipped with professional machine guns, sniper rifles, and armored trucks. Then there is the Jalisco cartel. It's the fastest growing one since it took them only six months to expand from one coast to another. According to the stats, Mexico's most recent death toll has outpaced all the historic figures collected over the past 30 years. Over 30,000 people were reported dead or missing in 2019 alone, whilst unofficial figures must be much greater. All the Russians who live in Mexico warned me that it is a borderline crazy to go to the Guerrero state because it is currently the most dangerous state there is and it's where the main drug war is taking place. It's where they stop cars and shoot people like what happened recently when some traveling musicians were shot for no reason. Mexico also takes the fourth place in the world by the number of killed journalists, coming right after Afghanistan, Iraq, and India. As an example, one of the cartels recently shot a local journalist who was investigating the ties they have with the government. They also left a message in her car that read, for speaking too loud. This, of course, is not just a random trip for me, and I have people expecting me on the other side. Still, even this doesn't really guarantee that everything will go to plan. 
And although these guys know that I am a foreigner, and they are supposedly meant to be my friends, who knows what will happen and how things will turn out. To start with, I hope they show up, and they will navigate us to the roads where people don't get shot. Carlos, my guide, is the first Armenian I've ever met who doesn't speak Russian. He was born and lived in Mexico nearly all his life. We made a turn for the main road, and now this is very much resembles a neighborhood from GTA. Random dudes on every corner, and right away they start checking us out. And it's better to leave the things at the room, at the hotel, and then we're able to walk with little cash. You don't walk with all the, your money. No. If you don't have money, they might get upset. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a tip, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Guys, before I reach that place in Mexico, I want to ask you a question. Do you love mobile gaming? If so, check out Raid Shadow Legends in the link below. It's available on PC and mobile devices and it's absolutely free. You can join a clan and team up to take on the dungeon bosses or collect artifacts and level up your champions. Here are some cool champions that I like the most. Edel's one of the starter champions and she has an awesome multi-hit attack that does three guaranteed hits and that third hit has a high chance of placing a wicked debuff that makes the enemy take more damage. Edel can mow down hordes of enemies fast. This makes her a very decent farmer and a great overall damage dealer. Ohudin does absolutely insane damage. He can buff himself before attacking and deliver an extra hard hit that decreases the attack if the enemy somehow manages to survive. Hoden works really well against waves of enemies and you can make for a strong mid-game farmer or a very solid attacker choice for your team. Just in time before holidays, this game got its biggest update ever. With the Doom Tower and its 120 floors of secret challenge rooms and 12 new bosses to battle. To go with the update, Raid Shadow Legends uh, released Bulwark to help everyone get started in the tower. Click the link in the description below to get a leg up on the competition. With a free void champion, XP booster, 50 gems, energy refills and an ancient shard available as soon as you start playing. And don't forget Bulwark, the champion you get for free. You will find your extras in your inbox for the 30 following days only. So go to the description, download uh, Raid Shadow Legends and support my channel. And now let's get back to Mexico. If you think that getting to Mexico was as easy as jumping on a plane, well, you're wrong. Thanks to lockdown, direct flights from Moscow were back. And hence, first I had to take a train to the border with Belarus. What an awesome start to the trip. My train departs from platform 13 and my carriage is also, yep, number 13. I'm departing from Moscow and here we go. My first checkpoint is a town called Novozibkov near the Belarusian border. The only way you can leave the country is if you have some documents that prove the purpose of your trip and I obviously had them, not to break any international laws. Unlike some who cross the border illegally through the forest and this is what it looks like. That forest there is Belarusia. This area is heavily patrolled right now in a bid to stop illegal border crossing. Patrol cars are everywhere. I saw the first one as early as 5 a.m. The only way you get an update on the patrol intel is to ask local mushroom pickers. Is there anyone up ahead? There is a myriad of roads that link the two countries, and since it's impossible to control all of them, custom police try to be smart about it. Do you need help? There is no way to pass this. It's too heavy. Or maybe it's an ambush and they're watching us as I speak, and planning on where to best get us. Let's hope not. Eventually I decided not to risk it and crossed the border through an official customs point. We've just reached the main checkpoint in Belarus. Yep, and every time I end up in some city in Belarus, that's not the capital, it feels as if it's an upgraded city out of the Soviet Union. You've got Burger King here, but then you walk into the train station and you get soaked in Soviet Union with the statue of Lenin and the rest. Tripwise, it took me five hours to reach the capital, then a short flight to Amsterdam, followed by a direct flight to Mexico. No idea why, but all European airports have condom dispensers in the loose. I mean, why? Are you all super spontaneous here? I've never seen Amsterdam airport this empty. This is such a weird feeling to finally be aboard, after the lockdown we had. 
What's crazy is that this is meant to be one of the busiest airports in Europe. And look at it now, not a single soul with rare occasions. The flight takes 12 hours and despite the lockdown, those planes that travel to tourist locations in Mexico are usually quite full. And the tourism in the country continues to grow. As for the towns that are caught in the cartel wars, well, they are very different to the rest of the country. No one ever goes there apart from the locals. We are on our way to the city that serves as a symbol of the narco wars in Mexico. It's where 40 students who protested against the local city mayor suddenly disappeared as if they never existed at all. Their bus was stopped on the way to a strike. And whatever mayhem happened next is still a mystery. 43 students disappeared with no trace, making it a global scale event that was covered by practically every news channel in the world. The students were stopped by police, fired on, they were handed over. Parents of the vanished students march a year after to commemorate the tragedy. Several people were killed and 43 students disappeared. The problem is that in order to get to their college, they had to pass a city called Trixtla that is controlled by three separate gangs. I found a little hideout to fire up my drone and check out the surroundings. It's a bit scary to fly a drone in such places, to be honest with you, because you never know what can happen. I can get shot, for example. This town is split between the gang Los Ardios, it's them who killed the students, and then we have Los Rojos, who are part of the largest drug cartel in the Mexican Gulf, and the Cartel del Sur that controls the surrounding heroin fields. We are meant to meet up with someone who will take us across the state, but he is not picking up. We haven't even entered the city yet, but already I feel as if we're entering someone's flat without asking. You sit in your car and everyone is staring at you, especially the tattooed guys. Then there are randomly parked cars with watchers who stop cars at will. A loaded weapon, police checkpoint, broken glass everywhere, and expensive cars, which is surprising given how poor the city is. This here is the real Mexico. It's hot, poor, and dangerous. Even police are armed, like there's no tomorrow. Turns out it's how police roam the streets, even in Mexico City these days. Finally, we've met up with our connect, who will now give us survival instructions. They will first come collect some intel on you before you can be let in. Make sure you don't film anything when we enter the city. Don't let them see you with a camera. The region is controlled by a so-called humanitarian police, which in reality is linked to a cartel. We'll have to lower the windows. So they see us, right? Yeah. And if they ask us to stop, we stop. We'll talk to them and let's not get the cameras out before they identify us. Our job is to enter the city and talk to a student who could have been 44th dead on that day. He saw the slaughter with his own eyes but managed to escape. It's very hard to watch people like him because he is being watched and he may not be willing to talk to us. There has been a lot of attention around this case recently because a bone of one of the students was found. The problem is that since cartel is linked to what happened, they're not too happy when someone comes and starts asking questions. In case you wonder if I'm scared, well, I'm not, but I'm wary. Wary because it's a very different culture. I speak too little Spanish to analyze what's happening around me, the atmosphere. And last but not least, there is nowhere to hide because it's a fully enclosed town. Yep, what else? I mean, you can run, but there is just nowhere to hide, really, as the gang members are on every street. Therefore, we must obey the rules they set. Do not flex our wills and wants and do everything they say. It's a toll road that takes you to the city. And of course, it's also accompanied by a gunman. Then there is a police station with no one inside. 
город не контролирует. Практически все люди ездят с собой. Check these local stores. Two sticks stuck into the pavement, some sheets over it, and the shop is ready. Taxis resemble a grown-up version of a scooter, yet they're all rickshaws. Or how come some grandma's queuing to wash the clothes since there is no water at home? The town is full of unfinished buildings and weird garages, all covered with sheets instead of proper roofing. I see that some streets are blocked by the gangs. They just put a truck in the middle of the road with three people in it. Так выглядит въезд в ту самую школу. This is what the entrance to the school looked like. It is a school where those students were from, and apparently it's safer here compared to the city, because the school keeps a constant fight for its rights. As you see, these here are the pictures of those who went missing. They are regarded as heroes, and even though a bone of one of the students was recently discovered, locals still believe that the students are alive, because there is no proof of anything else. As for the bone, they just accept that one of the guys must have lost a leg, but it doesn't quite stipulate death of the whole group of them. Josimar Fernandez, nicknamed Onion, was with the rest of the group on that day. This guy used to be my roommate, Miguel Angel Mendoza, my friend. I call him when everyone disappeared. On the night of the 26th of September 2014, the students took off to a demonstration in a nearby city. They never made it there though. Armed gang members surrounded the bus, screaming that everyone is going to die. They threw tear gas grenades inside and then held the bus driver at gunpoint, exclaiming that he'll die too. Police started to shoot at us. They were shooting to kill. We got out of the bus and started throwing stones at them, but it was useless. Some of us were very scared, some weren't. We tried to protect ourselves with stones, but the police just kept on shooting. One of the policemen shot at my friend. He was extremely aggressive, but we carried on. It was a slaughter. They wanted us to turn around and live together with the bus. Eventually, the students managed to get away from the police, but then at some point, the police was joined by gang members on a pickup truck, armed with weapons that were much more serious than smoke grenades. We are now entering the most dangerous neighborhood in Mexico City. No, no camera? Bloody everybody stops me and tells me to stop filming. Guess I've got a bit too far from my guides. You know, no, no, face no. Some dude saw me filming and now is kind of following me around. He was asking why I was filming the neighborhood. The place is like a separate world. And I take it, the only reason why I'm not getting beaten up right now is because my guide is sorting the issue out. This neighborhood is called Tepito, and it's only 10 minutes from the city center. You just pass the Norte Zone sign, and the city suddenly transforms from calm streets and mask-wearing people to one massive outdoor market, with its own laws, or street rules to be precise. At first glance, this is just an average harmless market. People sell some random stuff. Clothes, shampoos, God knows what. But then the interesting part begins. This here is a state within a state. It's a humongous area where people don't only trade but live and work at some makeshift, secretive manufacturing facilities. All right, everyone, meet Alfonso, born and raised in Tepito. Every evening and night, this place turns into drug trafficking central. It's packed with drug dealers who sell as they want, or as they say, things that make your nose happy and cheerful. It's what turns Tepito into a state of impunity, regardless of the fact that Tepito is part of downtown, the heart of the city. No one cares about our neighborhood. Streets are full of crime, and police turn this place into a legal district for drugs. Don't get me wrong, there is still police in some districts here, but in general, they are non-existent especially when it comes to Tepito, which is under control of La Union Cartel. It's the most influential cartel in the capital. And their watchers are on every corner of every street here. 
See that guy in black wearing a nice looking uniform? That's one of the watchers. He sees me, turns away and starts talking into his radio. Then a local whistles at me and advises me not to film. These watchers, the patrons as many call them, spotted me right away and made me sign not to film anything. And if you don't put your camera away, I guess it's when the problems start. There will be no more smiles if that happens. A truck came out of nowhere and people that were in it started shooting at us. This is when they got my friend. He ended up in coma. These, of course, were not your usual police rubber bullets, but the real stuff. We asked police for help, but they didn't move a finger to save my friend's life. He was unconscious, and we were still being surrounded. As it turned out later, the guys with machine guns were part of the Guerreros Unidos cartel. They took the students for members of some other cartel and decided to shoot them all as per usual. Whilst police, controlled by the mayor who hated the protesters, in turn supported the cartel and their actions. We met one of our teachers nearby. She shows a place where we can hide, and it was one very long and rainy night for us. It's when we found out that two of our other friends were also shot. Despite of all that, one of the students decided not to stay at the hideout. He was not keen on taking part in the demonstration in the first place, and told us that he has a kid and he wants to see him grow. So he left the hideout to go home, but was captured by the police. Later, we found out that they were tortured him and burned his face with cigarette butts. Another version that circles around is that those students actually stole the bus that belonged to the cartel, and it just so happened that it was packed with cocaine. The whole case is still a mystery. According to some, they were taken to the local dump and burned alive, but people don't believe in that. It's just not logical. It's impossible to burn 43 bodies at the dumpster because fire does not evaporate bodies. More so, dumps are usually very humid and hence we don't fall for this, whilst government insists for this specific version. Tepito has always been a place where you can find anything you want, including pistols, machine guns, shotguns, you name it. And if you need it in volumes, then they've got your back too. We'll now try to go further in to see what happens in these markets. <laughs> As a random passerby, you will only see flamboyant looking locals selling food, deflated footballs, empty aftershave bottles, stolen car stereo, dinosaur age hoovers and broken Rubik's cubes. Elderly ladies clean cactus leaves, others make flapjacks for tacos. Still, if you take a look around, you'll notice a symbol of local gangs hanging at every junction, shoes strapped to cables. When someone dies, their shoes get hanged up. There aren't many of them. They fall down when it rains, but there are lots of them. In order to grasp just how many people get killed here, a local artist made a large graffiti to commemorate everyone who dies on these streets. At first, he painted their faces, but then switched to silhouettes, only the walk towards the horizon. It's very hard to film anything here because the cartel wants to control every documentary and news report. You have to ask for their permission first. Ask the cartel. Yes, and it's quite an impossible thing to do. The more we stayed in Tepito, the more people knew us. Everyone kept telling me to stop filming, and things were starting to heat up. Another thing that didn't play in our favour is that two weeks prior to my arrival, some gangs attacked the Minister of Security, as a result of which two police officers and passers-by were killed. As of then, police started to press on Tepito, whilst Tepito gangs became very suspicious of newcomers. We're trying to reach out to one of the main cartel guys who controls the area of Tepito. It's a very aggressive cartel. They hate newcomers. And me being here without preliminary notice has already pissed them off. Everyone is becoming tense, but we try to be open. We told them that we're not looking for any conflict. We just want to talk and ask for their point of view. Let's see what they come back with. Did he sound scared when you called him? Onion called his friend right when they were brought to the dump. He didn't sound scared. In fact, the phone was in his pocket, but I've heard them running somewhere. The mayor, who used the situation to put an end to protests, is now under arrest, along with many cartel members. But since then, nothing in this region has changed. This is what the current students say. Here's Rodrigo. His parents are farmers. Guerrero is the most violent state with drug trafficking of an enormous scale. There are lots of fields here, and therefore that this is where opium and weed are made. This is what these fields look like, and when you approach them, you get asked to switch your phone off, so that your location is not recorded via GPS. It's impossible to reach these places by car. Instead, you have to walk for 45 minutes from the nearest road. 
It's roughly 50,000 people who farm opium. We sell one kilogram for around 300 to 400 dollars. But it's during the rain season. And opposingly, you get a higher quality and product in the dry season that can then be sold for over a thousand dollars. These days, when narcos planted fields that were visible from space are long gone. Gang members come here to the fields and start to threaten the farmers. They practically make them plant opium. And if farmers don't agree, they just kill their families or kidnap relatives. There's no question whether they are capable of doing it. And hence farmers always agree. If they don't, then kidnapping starts and it happens all the time. Local farmers usually don't try to play Rambos and plant whatever they get told to plant, especially when it's only how they can earn more than a dollar per day. We used to be scared of helicopters that spray toxins in our fields, but helicopters are gone now. These days, it's the killers who we are scared of, the sicarios. We sell radish for 30 cents, cabbage for 80 cents, and pumpkin seeds for $1.10. We always leave the notion that gangs can come at any given moment. It seems as if you've traveled back to the 19th century when you visit these regions. People pray to the rain, treatments don't go beyond swallowing hot water, and give birth by hanging themselves with a rope from the ceiling. In order to reach such place, I need to get in touch with someone who controls these towns. And unsurprisingly, these people live a different life. Okay then. A week of negotiations and we're finally having a response. We are now going to meet a guy who is locally known as Korean, although he is actually Mexican. Apparently he sells everything from guns to whatever else, although he is a tattoo artist by trade. Nice, you get a tattoo and a gun as a compliment most likely. He obviously doesn't post online ads, but everyone who needs a gun knows him. Even if you don't know such people, you just ask around and someone will direct you to him. One way or another, you will end up at his shop, be it in one person you ask or more. Things start to turn strange very quickly. First, my guide talks to some random woman. Then a guy pops out of nowhere, gives my guide a phone. I have no idea how they found us. He'll be here in 30 minutes. We then wait for two hours. And finally, they tell us that this is where the interview will take place. I start setting up and then someone else comes with a tattoo on his neck that reads, only God can judge me, and a tattoo of a grenade right next to it. He is followed by two younger guys who constantly whisper something to each other, call someone, and then take us to a different location. We are now entering the zone where no cameras are allowed. They told me I can't even film on my small camera, and it's critical that no one sees any of my equipment, because it's an area where no strangers are allowed, especially with cameras. See you in a bit. It's somewhere here where we make things you don't talk about, and therefore the level of attention to us is colossal. We come across two policemen on a scooter, and I see how tense everyone becomes. <laughs> green light to go on. We pass a guy smoking weed, and unfortunately I can't show you what's happening inside due to YouTube rules. We are now in some courtyard. We went through a door no one would typically pay attention to, and this is where we find a tattoo spot. I'm going in. My first question to the Korean is whether those policemen have any clue what's going on in here, and what happens if someone snitches on them. If you show police that it is the place where the drugs are sold, then cartel will find and kill you. Thing is, police knows all the drug spots anyways, but they do nothing, because they get paid. Of course, if someone comes to them and points at a specific location, they will have to investigate. But at the same time, they will let the gangs know that there is a snitch inside. This neighborhood is split into streets, where each is controlled by separate gangs. All streets are under someone's control. Korean was born in Tepito, and more specifically right here, because his tattoo spot is part of his parents' house. His father was gang affiliated, and crime was always around the Korean since childhood. Boys. He used to rob houses and people on the streets. I remember constant gang wars for territory. Once, some people came to our house and attacked my dad. 
it was a proper battlefield. One of those guys stuck his knife into my father's heart, and my dad nearly died back then. Only 10 minutes away from the Korean, there is a totally different Mexico. This is the city business district, and would you just look at these stunning buildings? You've got the so-called skyscrapers here, and the reason why I said so-called is because there is simply no way how you can build them higher than this, due to all the earthquakes that shake this region. Therefore, these tall buildings are quite an achievement, because local earthquakes usually wipe half the city out. Those who live near the coast don't even bother settling in their houses for long, or build something substantial, because it's either an earthquake or a hurricane that will get it at some point. There are even seasons when hurricanes begin and come one after another. Despite all this and the cartel wars, Mexico is the richest country in Latin America after Brazil, and it's 15th place in the world by GDP, which means that countries like Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, Norway and Netherlands are all below it. Mexico city centre is like a little version of Manhattan. There are double-deckers roaming the city, just like in London. And thanks to a myriad of CCTV cameras, many districts are absolutely secure, even in the evenings. Elena is originally from Moscow, but she now lives in Mexico City full-time. And guess how much she's renting this flat out for? She makes a living by building musical instruments, singing, performing and teaching. And this flat costs her $950. Whilst in Moscow, you'll struggle to find anything for this price. Exactly. What do you like about this place? I love how easy people are here. You can be waiting for your coffee outside a takeaway and then start chatting to people in the queue. I think it's common for southerners. Ten minutes later, your best friends are ready. Everything that has to do with communication is just super easy. If a club gets shut at 2am, everyone starts looking for the next place to move to. In Europe, people would have just gone home because order is primary there. But here, it's just a never-ending flamboyancy. They have to finish all their drinks and dance until the sun starts to rise. Does this ring any bells? Constant festivals in colourful sombreros, rope fights in masks, Mexico has the most fun-filled parties ever during the holidays, and people travel for over 15 hours for this. Tacos, as you know, are the main dish here, but I decided to try this instead. Scorpions, caterpillars, swamp mosquitoes, ants, and grasshoppers. Bear Grylls, go I remember that Bear Grylls once said that these have lots of protein. Caterpillars are filled with it. Okay, let's uh, try this. It's tasty. I don't think so. Ah, I like it. This is bad. Why though? Actually, it's better now since I swallowed it. It's crispy. Grasshoppers taste like... I'd assumed a dry fly would taste the same. I think a fly would be a little bit more fat. I agree, but this one is dry, like a light version of a fly. For those who are losing weight. Yeah. Think of it as crisps. Some really shitty crisps. They're very popular in Oaxaca, which is a city in the south. And it's usually elderly people that sell them. Next, we have the swamp mosquitoes. Mmm. Swamp mosquitoes are... They're quite sandy, don't you think? Yeah. As if a fly was mixed with the sand you get in the Maldives or Goa. It's not the typical sand, I, I call it like micro sand actually. You enjoy every step when you walk on it. And finally comes the mite. I mean, you wouldn't eat a mite, right? It doesn't smell like a mite. Oh yeah, they usually smell horrid. <laughs> yeah, guy's a freaking bug. Jesus, never in my life did I imagine it had come to this. It's bitter. I hate it. Don't eat bugs, people. Was it similar to the way they usually smell? There is no smell, but it has something bitter inside. I hate this part of my bits. It's only the poor districts where people eat this stuff. And as for traditional food, of 
of course it's tacos. The flapjack is made from corn flour and it tastes... Although I couldn't figure the right description for it back then, I can now. It tastes like wet cardboard. All the food you can think of becomes a taco in Mexico. This is my three-course meal. I've got meat, some mash, but in the end, you make a taco out of it. See, you just combine your rice with beans, some meat, then mash, and regardless of how hard you try, you still end up with a taco. I've done a Russian-style taco here, soaked in meat sauce. Mezcal is the main drink of any local party. It's like tequila, but better because it's not mass-produced. Think of it as vodka, but stronger. It's a 55% alcohol. So it's stronger than vodka, and apparently you drink it as if you're kissing it, sip by sip. Let me try. That was a kiss too deep, I think. Honestly, although it's 50%, uh, I can say it's more harsh. It tastes as if you mix aloe with vodka and end up with vodka that has been infused with herbs. Mexico City is where you come across random dudes sleeping on the pavements covered by pieces of plywood. But in general, the local vibrancy takes your breath away. Look at these happy couples, for example, dancing the lockdown away for the rest of the world. The streets here are shared by drug dealers. Like this one, who decided to go undercover as soon as he saw me filming. And families who changed diapers some 10 meters away. Graffiti is everywhere, as well as drying clothes, pants on hangers, and specialized drying cages. Another thing that you see practically everywhere you go are little markets. Here is something very local for you. Fancy some music on a USB? You come with your USB and they upload some tunes on it. Or you can buy a USB with preloaded music if you don't have one. What a thing! When was the last time you heard gunshots in Tepito? Ayer? Yesterday. Really? <laughs> it's an everyday thing, isn't it? It's like the Tepitos atom, daily thing. Maybe someone had a birthday and decided to shoot in the air. What about gunshots related to cartel wars? Must have been three days ago. Some guy got killed near the block where I live. Nothing serious, just a gunfight. Then police came to take the body. The guy was from a different gang. Main rule here is not to get others stuck with your own problems. You do your thing and it does not relate to everyone else but you. Otherwise, you just don't respect the pito. But even these rules started to disappear with time. Back in the day, there was robberies and kidnapping, but everyone respected the neighborhood. Nowadays though, youngsters don't show their same respect. They can come and try dealing with drugs outside of the area. But it is also when people on bikes and trucks appear and restores justice because rules shouldn't be broken. Tepito is like a city within a city with its own yards and districts. See this place? It's a typical local house where people have lived for generations. Inside, there is a restaurant. You walk in, right into the kitchen, then wash your hands. Yep, you just scoop some water and get the dirt off your hands. The kitchen is right opposite. And as you can see, they've got shitloads prepared already. And then you enter the living room, which is turned into a restaurant hall with a big table that most of us would have in our living rooms too. So you just sit here enjoying your homemade meal and stare at pics of someone's relatives. Next come the weird balconies that I've never seen before. They don't have any railings and locals seem to use them as a storage for things they don't need. This is what a typical courtyard looks like inside these buildings. It's an enclosed space and only people who live here can access it. This here is where they wash their clothes. Yep, it's just crate looking things made out of bricks. You put your stuff in and then rub it. Water comes from that barrel and then you just hang everything to dry like we saw earlier. Oh, and most lampposts are wrapped in barbed wire so that no one steals the bulbs. Mexicans seem to have a different take on death and turn it into a cult. Sometimes women say they pray to the devil. Seriously, people come to makeshift death churches and leave cigarettes and beer here. Apparently it's what death prefers to flowers. 
The logic behind it all is that everyone is equal when it comes to death regardless of whether you've been selling drugs or served in a church. Okay, we'll choose Many people are scared of that, but we aren't. I love that, for example. It symbolizes recovery and intellect to me. Welcome to the typical family house in Tepito. There isn't much space, the sofa is wrapped in plastic bags, and as for chairs, they are all folding. This is what the interior is like. Entrance is followed by a kitchen. There is a table, but a folding one too, since space is of the essence. Then we have a bedroom that you cover with a curtain and a lounge where I guess people can hang around. Although second floor is where everyone spends most of their time. It's just one room, probably seven square meters at most. There is some space where you can iron your clothes, a washing machine behind a bed. It may seem that everything is piled on top of each other, but in reality, all the necessities are present. This house accommodates a family of five, the wonderful senora, her husband, children and grandchildren. We own a spot at the market. We sell bags, bells, accessories in general. Is it true that there are people you pay money to every month? I can't talk about that. Because you're scared? Yes, <laughs> very scared. People are scared because it's the cartel members that control the market. To be specific, I'm talking about La Union Cartel that I mentioned earlier. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're selling bags, belts or even lemonade, you still have to pay and share with the cartel. Actualmente... La Union Cartel took the market under its control and everyone who works here must pay them monthly. Those who don't, disappear from here quickly. I was jailed in 1999 for kidnapping and also for being part of the gang. I had this friend who worked for one very rich Korean and we decided to kidnap the guy. We weren't kidnapping people on a daily basis, no. But it seemed as a good opportunity to use at the time. Plus, the Korean wasn't paying for protection. If you ask the Korean what he does for a living, he'll tell you tattoo artist and actor and a few other little things. I heard that... Uh, Escuché I've que... heard you can buy pretty much anything here, is that true? Casi no like, todo. Not nearly everything. Everything. You can buy cars, bikes, guns, everything you want. Can you get hold of a Kalashnikov? Yep, including Italian guns like Barretta, machine guns. An M16? Sure, we call it corn because of the look of its barrel. And how much would it cost roughly? Well, twelve hundred dollars will get you a good Kalashnikov. Small caliber guns start at three hundred. No one would sell one to me, right? No, but they sell it to me and I can then pass it to you. On a serious note though, if you happen to stroll into one of these places, they'll just take everything you have on you and kick you out. What if you want someone to get killed? Is that something that can be arranged? If you pay well... How much do you reckon it would be? A couple of grand. I'm now boarding my flight to Guadalajara, which is where one of the most influential cartels is located. They are known for being super cocky, audacious, and cultivation of seedless weed, which is apparently much easier to transport because it can be packed tighter. You basically fit a third more into a truck, which is obviously handy when it comes to logistics. Thank I met by Ray, who was born and raised in Guadalajara. He too has spent some time in jail for drug trafficking. Nice bar. They shut it down because they kill people inside. They just walk in and they kill uh, the son of one of the rich guy here in Guadalajara. Two years ago, local graveyards ran out of space as a result of continuous cartel wars. So the government decided to stock dead bodies in refrigerated semis, causing a wave of indignation as locals started to complain about the smell and flies as refrigerators attracted. Opposingly, the godfathers are buried in fully fledged castles and villas that go up to 500,000 in price. Yep, no one lives in these houses. They serve as graves to the cartel leaders. We 
now entering the most gang-filled neighborhood in Guadalajara, and I see how the scenery quickly starts to change. The cartels use these neighborhoods as kidnapping central. They take their victims to these houses, and what's convenient is the police is not allowed to enter property. Plus, they mostly don't even bother coming here. Like this, look at this house that we're gonna see right here. How in the hell do you explain that? A nice house in an area like this. As mentioned earlier, Ray was also jailed for drug trafficking. It happened after he moved to the US at the age of 15, and his friend offered him a job. We took 100 kilos from Los Angeles to Phoenix, Arizona. It's weird because it's a long way. It's a long way, way. It's a long way, and I was making, like I say, 25 per, per pound, so 50 per kilo, and we hid it in the ceiling, and that was my fear. You know, like if I get pulled over, I had no license to start with, so I was driving you all. You had over. no driving license? No, I was 15. <laughs> I, had, I didn't even have papers, so I was driving all over the country. He was paying me 200 dollars. Now, actually, with him, I was making more, much more. Four it, times more? No, much more, because I think the first trip I make like 7000 And it was $7,000 on one trip per 10 pounds, oh. because it was speed. It was a different drug, it was mm -hmm. more expensive. But I, I didn't drop, I didn't do anything. I just put them on a, on a backpack and I got on the truck. Another super Mexican thing is that they all love to clean their shoes. You stroll around in the city center and these shoe cleaners come one after another. Never seen so many of them in any other country in the world. I mean, look, it's seven of them just in this corner. You cross the street and there are even more. This is because Mexicans consider their shoes to be a show of who they are. You put yourself on the map at a meeting if you have tidy shoes. That's how it works. You practically roll your balls out and the result of the, uh, the meeting is fully dependent on it. Another utterly normal thing to see in the city is a funeral procession. And it's not the president's funeral, no, it's just the way things are done here. A very surprising problem in Mexico is the lack of tap water, which is strange given that the city was built by Aztecs on a massive lake and initially looked as if it was Venice. Aztecs saw an eagle holding a snake and decided that it is a sign of a perfect place for a city. They started to build dams, bridges, and eventually dried the lake to such an extent that nowadays some neighborhoods get their water supply from trucks. Mexico, we don't have a uh, permanent uh, bomb of water in the cities. It could be one hour, it could be three hours. So that's the reason that we have all these cisterns on the roof that when you have the, the power to pump water, then you fill your tank and then you use it from there. Oh. Because it could be the half of the day that you don't have water or could be weeks. There are more people here than in some cities in India, a place where sometimes you want to lock yourself in the bathroom to spend some time on your own. Mexico City is the most densely populated city in the world, accommodating 22 million people, which in pandemic free times meant atrocious traffic jams. Thankfully though, their underground is one of the most developed in North America, coming right after New York. This is what the Mexico City underground looks like. I've just passed a guy who was enjoying a joint. But as for the underground, a single trip costs around 30 cents. What's different is that these carriages run on proper tires, which is very similar to the underground in Paris. Tires make for a very comfy ride. And last but not least, there are more stations here than in Chicago, Washington and Toronto. There is something new to me. You see this metal railing here? It is written here that this area is for women and children only. And there is even a policeman who controls that no men enter. This was done to protect the women from getting uh, sexually assaulted, killed and so on, which happens quite often, I would assume. See, it reads exclusively for women and children. Don't you just love the Spanish language? I don't know it, unfortunately, but I love the way it sounds. Imagine walking into a loo at a restaurant, for example, and seeing the male toilet being called caballeros. Based on the uh, neighborhoods I've been to here, it may seem as if Mexico is all about narcos. Although I assume this is a wrong understanding? Look, I, mean, I try not to put myself in places and situations that are an obvious no-go. I mean, I've traveled across the whole of South America and seen many things. But you just know that, for example, this place is all right and the other one isn't. 
There's a neighborhood called Lomas, for example. It's where super rich people live, in their huge mansions and 24 seven security and all. But it's also where the chief of police was shot a couple of weeks ago at 6 a.m. Word on the street is that Tepito's own union cartel was behind all this, but overall it's a norm when a cartel tries to kidnap or kill politicians and their families in a bid to push their way through. Cartels simply cannot operate without political protection, and therefore they constantly try and find common grounds with them. These days, cartels don't just do drugs. Judging by Tepito, their main business is fake clothing. We have a chance to see how these clothes are made. The clothes that are sold on the markets locally. Okay, sorry. Oops, she asked not to film. But yeah, she is finalizing a Gucci bag right now. Some, of course, import these clothes from China, but most people set their local manufacturing. Production is quite the same in the whole neighborhood, where nearly every house has a room where they make these accessories. There is a sewing machine here and bags of freshly made clothes, like this Nike jacket that was finished a second ago. Of course, like any legit product, this stuff comes with branded labels. We make the labels here too. But just so you know, we operate under Nike license, unlike the rest. It's a profitable business, we love it. How much do you make? Around $1,500 per month. For comparison, an average wage in Mexico City is $350. And if you want to earn more, you must have the balls to partner with a cartel. In some cities though, you don't even have a choice and you have to pay the cartel for protection. This, for example, is the city of Chilpancigo, which is the capital of the gang-filled Guerrero state, which is where we started our journey. It's where the cartels are so deeply integrated into the economy that even the grocery store prices already include the cartel's margin. Imagine that, meat, tomatoes, alcohol, everything. Jose Luis makes and sells mezcal. And just like the rest of the population, he too pays the cartel on a weekly basis. The cartel costs begin with $20 and reach $2,500 every 15 days. They would threaten, torture you or kill you, kill your relatives to get their money. It's common for them to kill someone as a showcase of what would happen if we don't obey. They have their own meat distribution network. And at the same time, we make all meat shops pay them extra for protection. At times, they can send their people to monitor your sales. And if something goes wrong, they'll just confiscate your shop from you. These additional fees include the price of the products, and it becomes unprofitable to continue the business. They asked a guy that they wanted one trailer full of uh, food for uh, cows and, you know, animals. And the guy's like, you know what, you give me 50% ahead, and once I deliver it, you give me the other 50%. And he's like, no, you're just gonna deliver it. He's like, no, I'm not gonna deliver it. Next day, they found the heads guy. Those who run bars and restaurants operate on different terms with the cartels. They ask you, you wanna pay, or you want us to run our business inside? Which it means that you can walk into a nightclub or a bar, and you can see him, you know, selling dope, whatever you want. Selling what? Selling dope, drugs. drugs. I don't know, whatever you want, cocaine, pills, med. <laughs> if you don't want them in your business, you pay. This is how it works, guys. See that guy behind me? He just stands here by the loos and offers everyone drugs. Mexico's black market economy started long before the world got acquainted with cocaine and heroin. And it's hard to blame Mexicans for it because it's all down to the geography. They're stuck between the most developed economy in the world, the US, and Colombia, that produces everything that's in huge demand, but at the same time is banned in the US. Back in the 20th century, during the introduction of dry states in the US, Mexicans were the ones who supplied them with alcohol. At first, they did it single-handedly, and these people were called bootleggers because they actually wore boots that had wooden patches on the soles to make their footprints look as if they were cows passing by. Therefore, sheriffs didn't pay much attention to those when searching for secretive bootlegger trails. At some point, the supply increased to such an extent that alcohol production in Mexico increased eightfold. Once the dry laws were cancelled, Mexicans started to import weed. And no, it wasn't some kind of weed you'd grow on your balcony. In 1984, a field of weed was discovered worth over $3 billion, which is more than what Saudi's oil reserves used to cost. There was enough weed there to fill the road from New York to Washington, which excuse you me, is roughly 400 kilometers long. Shortly after, it was followed by Colombian cocaine, when Escobar and Cali cartels, the two most powerful cartels in the world, struck a deal with the most influential godfather in Mexico, Miguel Angel Feliz Gallardo. This is Adriana, and she knew Felix in person. We're all assholes, and we all were, were privileged kids. Yeah. You know, and here we are, we knew the government, we knew the governor, we knew the, 
president of the city. We, we you know, is like our parents' friends. And mm -hmm. it just gave us a lot of power. Yeah. And it was really bad because, and after a while, it stopped being fun. And it started being very, very scary where they had nothing to do and they would kill people. You know, you had to be very careful what you said. Yeah. Um, if you insulted them or if they thought they were you were insulting them, you were like, no. It, 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 it was, it's, it's a miracle that I'm sitting here talking to you today. One of the main godfathers in Tijuana was attracted to Adriana and was always around her at those crazy parties where people would ride their motorbikes into the pool and snort cocaine like there was no tomorrow. He was wearing his, his cowboy boots, mm -hmm. leather shorts, <laughs> mink vest, no shirt. It, it, it was very surreal. I was expecting this big guy, like macho, with like yeah. the guns and, you know, and it wasn't. It was this funny looking guy wearing leather shorts, boots, cowboy boots, and a mink jacket in the middle of June. Do you remember something shocking from this time? They're like, let's go to this party. And we go to this party and I walk in and there's Ramon giving out like little Envelopes with coke, you know, like the seal packages. And he was giving me one and I'm like, no, thank you. No, thank you. And he's like, what? Are you like straight age or what? I'm like, it doesn't matter what I am or not. You know, I'm not gonna take drugs from you because I'm not gonna go to bed with you. What the fuck are you thinking? And you're like the worst thing that could have ever happened to our society. And I just started going on and on and on and on. Like I know how to do. Yes. And all of a sudden the music stops. Uh -huh. And my voice just travels like all through the whole four walls of the party. My legs were like trembling because I thought he was gonna kill me right there and then. Oh, and these guys were capable of it. One of my good friends uh, was asked out by his brother and she didn't want to go out with him. So he had her brakes, the, the, the cables to the brakes cut. She was coming down a hill, uh -huh. but thankfully they had the, you know how they have the piles of sand uh -huh. in case your brakes go and you can just crash yeah, into those. She, so she crashed into those, oh. but it was, it was very scary. We're now in the most upmarket neighborhood in Guadalajara. It was practically formed when the main cartel started to make their first big money and went on a shopping spree, buying these houses left, right and center. This house here used to belong to one of the leaders of the cartel, and he too owned dozens of houses in the area, so that police don't keep track of his whereabouts. As for Ray, he never managed to earn this much, but still had two Cadillacs, an Audi and enough money for a good living. I was getting between five and 15,000 per kilo. Depends on how much they take because the price changes. The more they take, the cheaper it is. And I did that for like a year. And I got caught. I got caught because the guy that I was working with, he got caught. They were chasing him. Actually, he was under surveillance for like two years. Oh. So when I started working for him, he was already hot. Uh -huh. And I didn't know. We have a guy that, that was snitching on us. Uh, he was telling on us. He was recording us. He had microphones oh, and cameras. Really? So, so it was like a policeman undercover. Yeah, we had an undercover. Oh, 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 oh. A friend of his. Ray didn't care about much back then and rock and rolled his life away until after one party he returned from and fell asleep. I was sleeping naked, very nice, you know, hangover. It was funny because it was like a movie. Uh, FBI came, drug task force came, with the police department came. They came in the house, they, they didn't have a warrant, but my uncle let him in because I was living at my uncle's house. So he got scared, he opened the door. They came in, I didn't have, actually I have drugs, but they didn't see it. They searched the whole house. I have two guns. That's the reason they took me. But they already had a lot of, a lot of evidence against me, you know? Videos, DVDs, and mm. the guy, uh, he transcribed like 5,000 pages about me, so mm. they had me. US officials were planning on jailing Ray for 25 years, but since he cooperated with the police, his term was decreased to 57 months, which is a little less than five years. Once his jail term came to an end, he was deported back to Mexico, and he now works as an Uber driver, reminiscing of the fun times he had. Like like right now, you know, like you can be out at 10, 11, 12, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., you don't worry about nothing. Right now it's 10, you have to be. Yeah, but they were not violent as now, you know, they were not, they were all together. There was one cartel for the whole country. You'd be surprised, but it's the truth. Back then, the largest cartel in Guadalajara absorbed smaller cartels and turned into a monopoly. They called themselves Federacion, 
and it was making billions of dollars. Everything changed when the US DEA agent arrived and found the huge field I mentioned earlier. Right after it, he was kidnapped by the Guadalajara cartel, tortured for 30 hours and then killed. Since then though, cartels had to deal with consistent ambushes organized by both US and Mexican governments. Eventually, they even managed to capture Felix, the boss of the cartel. Just look in his eyes, he seems to be unstirred. He was the most powerful cartel boss in the whole history of Mexico. Federación was then split into smaller cartels, and a couple of years later, the massacres started between them at a scale that was never before seen by the police. Back in 96, we had, 96, 98, we had the worst violent criminal wave that we've ever had. Uh, people were being kidnapped left and right, people were being shot and killed. And my brother, my oldest brother, was kidnapped. According to the police, two of Adriana's brothers were also cartel members, and one is still in jail. Police regard him as a sicario, whilst the second brother just knew too much. The family, on the other hand, believes the police mixed up the two brothers and got the wrong one. They tortured them, and they, they would show him pictures of his, of his kids and of his wife and my parents and myself and my brothers and uh, like doing our daily stuff and saying, you know, well, we know where they are. and. It, it is only after 30 years of narco's dominance that the government decided to really fight back. In 2006, the elected president, Felipe Calderón, announced a war on narcos. He didn't have a plan really, and instead decided to send the army to the most roughest of the spots. As a result, by the end of his presidency, there were 120,000 victims of his war, which equates to 53 deaths per day for six years. It's 7am, and I'm in the capital of the most dangerous state in Mexico. We're about to leave to even crazier places. Because as it turns out, there are cities that are governed completely by the cartels, which means that they have their own police, own army, and they don't let the official government police an army in. My people, in the next episode, we will meet someone who controls not just one, but several different villages, and ask him to tell us what's up. Hey, what's up, Snum? We are right now in the middle of this self-proclaimed state, and as you see, it's not just checkpoints where you see people with guns, but even petrol stations. next episode, we will meet human traffickers who will not just take you over the border, but up to that famous wall for just a couple of grand. US is right next door to us now, and the only people who can stop us are the US patrols, because as for our trafficker friend, he pays to the cartel for security. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode, and do keep an eye on my Instagram page, where I'll be posting pictures from this trip. This is Leodov on How People Live.